So I'm wondering if anyone else was a bit disturbed by the readings that we heard just now that I've been sitting with this week. I was so delighted to see Everett and Ryan this morning and then wishing that these were not the stories we were telling them about the faith in which their parents are raising them. In the first reading, we have the God of Israel actually going to war with the armies of Pharaoh and finally drowning them spectacularly in the Red Sea. This comes after a series of plagues, the height of which we read about last week, which was the death of firstborn of everything, humans and animals, mass destruction, if ever there was one. And I cannot find myself comforted by today's parable, which seems to be Matthew's sermon on that tricky line in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. In this parable, there are apparently some major strings attached to that forgiveness of debt, which that hapless slave learned to his detriment when he was turned over to the torturers. And then we have that cryptic line that I hope was inserted into Jesus' mouth by the gospel writer. I hope he didn't say this himself. So my heavenly father will also do to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. From your heart, no less. I don't know about you, but my heart is just not that pure. A problem when we read these texts, of course, is that we are so, so distanced from their contexts. And the way we read them is so shaped by our own imagination about God maybe what we've been taught about the Bible, or even what we mean when we say forgiveness. It can be so difficult that it might be possible that we're just going to miss anything that might be helpful to us in a passage like this. This gospel parable, for example, usually gets boiled down to some you know, one-line moral. We must forgive and forgive again over and over, with forgiveness understood as a never-ending transaction of debt relief. And every commentary on this passage has noticed, has noted how it has been misused, how it has been used to encourage, for example, a battered spouse to forgive their partner and even stay in a relationship with them. That is, let us note, a truly absurd interpretation. Full stop. Peter's question that starts the whole thing is about relationships within the church, among believers. It's a question about how we are to relate to one another in this new community under the rule of God, this new community of the reign of God. But pointing out what the parable maybe does not mean still doesn't help us very much explore what it might mean. I think that's partially because this parable is rich in hyperbole from the start. It is itself almost absurd. Peter's question, must I forgive seven times, is meant to suggest the almost perfect limits of forgiveness. Seven times is a lot. He's not trying to get away with anything here. Must I forgive perfectly, he's asking? Jesus' response is, well, absurd, or at least nonsensical. No, he says, you must forgive perfectly, perfectly, perfectly squared. Forgiveness to infinity. Jesus might actually be saying, Peter, that's an absurd question, or just the wrong question. And then a parable rich also in hyperbole, absurdity. A king settles accounts with his slaves, but that's probably not the right word. It might be his government ministers, not the people who cook or clean or work in the fields. And this particular slave or minister owes 10,000 talents. That is basically an imaginary number. Just imagine piles and piles and piles and piles and piles of money. It's not a repayable debt. It would be like President Trump calling Secretary Treasury, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin to the White House and ordering him to pay back the entire national debt. And if he didn't do it, he would be sold with his family and all his possessions to try to pay off that $23 million. 
There is just no way any slave or government minister could owe this much money and no way he could pay it back even if he and all his family were sold along with all his possessions. It's absurd. But the hyperbole doesn't end there. When that slave begs for some more time to pay off a debt he could never pay off, the king, at least at first, forgives the whole debt, all $23 trillion of it. This is the king that was just about to sell the man and his family to pay off the debt. Well, what changed? It's kind of absurd. Now cut to scene two, out goes the now debt-free slave who comes upon a fellow slave or minister who owes an actual quantifiable amount, a hundred denarii, so a hundred days wages for common labor. That is a payable debt. Not much, certainly not in relation to the infinite debt just forgiven. Nevertheless, the now debt-free slave responds absurdly, actually choking his counterpart and throwing him in prison upsetting everyone who sees it, who then goes and tells the king what's happened. Then the king re-enters and we're back to absurdity. He reverses his debt forgiveness, so it did come with strings attached, and instead of selling the slave and his family, he has him tortured until he pays the whole debt, which is totally impossible because the debt is unpayable, so he's going to be tortured forever, or at least until he dies. It's absurd. Where is the good news in such a story? What can Jesus or the gospel writer be getting at? That God's forgiveness comes with very dangerous strings attached if we don't respond in kind? No one is looking good here, not even Jesus' heavenly father. Unless, unless Jesus' response at the very beginning is the key to the whole thing. How often must we forgive, that is, erase the debt we think someone owes us because of what they have done? I wonder if the purpose of this parable is to point out just how absurd that question is, how absurd the whole systems of transactions and debts really is, and thinking that that's forgiveness. Kings, this king and all of them, are absurd. They saddle people with debts they cannot pay. They, on a whim, demand it back, then forgive it all, then rescind the forgiveness. Where's the logic in that? Slavery is absurd. It degrades people and makes them into things and pits some slaves against others as they scramble for the leftover scraps. Debts are absurd. They lead to violence and cruelty and destroy relationships. So Jesus says, change your mind. Forgiveness is not some transaction in which a debt caused by one wrong is erased by the person that was wronged. All that will produce is a never ending and inescapable cycle of debt collection and debt forgiveness, an eternal spiral of tortured transactions from which there is no escape. Forgiveness, Harriet Mueller reminded, helped me understand as we were talking about this passage, forgiveness is a shape of grace within us that slowly releases us from imprisonment to that balance sheet of death, of debt, maybe both. It is the divine shape that we celebrated right at the beginning of this liturgy when we confessed and heard God announce that, that, that was long erased. That's not even the way to think about it. This divine shape of forgiveness helps us get free of that cycle to let go of the idea of kings and slaves and the debts that bind them and the economic and political systems that sustain them even now. We, after all, live in a world and in an economy that is built on the literal and figurative slavery of some and on debt. Mounds and mounds and mounds of debt, monetary debt, environmental debt, international debt, debts of justice and relationships that reflect all those debts. And it is all absurd and has produced a world that leaves many, many people living truly tortured lives. <laughs> 
and the rule of God is its opposite. No kings, no slaves, no debts, an entirely different state of affairs, though perhaps one hard to imagine. Perhaps that's why in the great story of the Exodus, for a moment only, God drowns it all. Pharaoh and his armies and the slavery and the oppression they represent drowned in the Red Sea. That kind of forgiveness, that change in our imagination is not something that happens overnight. It does take the 77 times, the continual commitment to try to see things as God sees them, to recognize the absurdity of the current state of affairs, how it doesn't match at all what God sees, and to try slowly, ever so slowly, to not allow ourselves to be directed by it anymore, at least as best we can. It takes a community that wants to inhabit and expand that space of forgiveness, a church perhaps, a group of people who seeks to practice a different kind of relationship altogether and not one based on debts. It can mean letting go of those old hurts ourselves, those payable debts that have more hold on us, really, as they do on those who supposedly owe us. Or at least it can mean not letting those debts really be anything greater than they are. That kind of forgiveness means allowing God to expand that forgiving shape within us so that we become ever more free and free to help others get free from this never ending torture of balance sheet transactions that never actually erase the debt. It is a spiritual practice as ever there was one, which over time leads to a kind of freedom that will allow everyone finally to live debt free. No one would even need to ask Peter's question anymore because the shape of God's forgiveness will have transformed us and the way we see the world.